טוב, so the last two שיעורים, we spoke about תיקון המידות, and we did a little in, uh, introduction to תיקון המידות. Just to, to kind of recap what we talked about the last two שיעורים, is that everything in the world below manifests from the ten sefirot. Everything that we have here was mishtal shel, going down in a, in, a, in a descending chain into this world from the spiritual structure from, of the spiritual worlds. And when I come and ask myself in this world, what am I doing here? What is my purpose here? Then I need to find out why Hashem put me in this world. Hashem didn't put me in this world to live here for 60-70 years to, to go on another vacation or to build another house or to, to, to just go through this life without any purpose. In order to reach to my purpose, Hashem gave me Torah and mitzvahs. That would be my, my guide to my purpose. Bechlal, the Torah and mitzvahs are like air and food to my neshama. The same way that my body needs food and air. I can't deprive my body from food or air. I can't deprive my soul from food and air. And the food and the air that the soul needs to eat is Torah and mitzvahs. So there's no difference between Jews. All the Jews are equal. We all have to do the same mitzvot. Some Jews have to do a little bit more, like priests. We find in different occasions that some Jews are exempt from certain mitzvot, but in general, the general path is that all the Jews are equal and they have to do the same mitzvot. Moshe Rabbeinu used to put tefillin on, exactly how I put tefillin on. So one cannot deprive his neshama from Torah and mitzvahs, and the second that the person deprives his neshama, his soul, from Torah and mitzvahs, it will, the neshama will start bugging him. So a lot of the, the things that we deal with is just because our neshama is not fulfilled. It's not getting enough air, or it's not getting enough mitzvahs. So it will start bothering us, the same way that you, you start fasting, and at some point, after a couple hours, your body will start hurting, your stomach will start hurting, then you get a headache, then you get a stomach ache, and so forth. Same thing with the neshama. If you deprive the neshama from what it needs to get, it will start bothering you. But I explained that Rabbi Chaim Vital, the, the, the most dominant Talmud of the Arizal, he says in the book Sharek Dusha that our main, main avodah in this world is Tikkun Amidot. A very short overview is that our soul is built from five levels. We spoke about it a couple times. The highest level of the neshama is called Yechida. comes from the word Yechud, unity. This is what's called the Chelek Eloka. Beneath this is a level that is called Tselem. It's called Chaya. Tselem is the Or Makif, is a surrounding light. Like they call it in English, Aura. The Tselem is the godly figure that gives us our shape. Betselem Elokim Nivra Adam. In the shape of Hashem, we were created. The tzelem is what gives us the, the shape. We, the tzelem has the hands, the legs, the structure of our body. I don't remember if I mentioned in one of the shiurim, but the tzelem is built from thousands and thousands of sparks corresponding to each day that I'm alive. So if you see a person that is alive for 60 years, then you can calculate 60 years times 360 days a year, add that to the leap years, and you'll come to the amount of days that he was alive. That's the amount of godly sparks that that neshama had, that that tzelem had. And every day he has to do a tikkun for one spark. And when he's done, he takes that spark up to Shemaim. That's why we go to sleep. Other than that, we wouldn't need to sleep. Hashem would create us in a system that we don't need to sleep, because sleeping is a waste of time. But the reason why we go to sleep is because we have two-thirds of our life we work down here, and one-third we go up with the spark that we elevated that day, and we take it up to its source. And if I do my avodah, my job that day, then I have what to take up with me. And if I finish the day the right way, with Kriyat Shema Lamita, by doing tshuva, by, kal, by uh, uh, finishing the day, then I go up with a spark, and that night my neshama gets charged, and I wake up in the morning with new kohot, with new powers. And if I don't do it the right way, I'm going to wake up in the morning with all sorts of side effects. I'm going to wake up lazy, I'm going to wake up sad, I'm going to wake up depressed, I'm going to wake up... 
with aches, I'm going to wake up tired. All these things is not because the bed is not comfortable, rather because my neshama didn't do the right job the day before. Therefore, at night it went to the wrong place, wasted its time, and now I'm coming up in the morning and I'm coming with no energy. <clears throat> this is all nogea to the tzelem, to the, what's called chaya. But then I have a neshama, ruach and nefesh. This is in my body. And we're operating in these three levels. Now the neshama is too holy to come into the body, so it gets dressed into the ruach, that gets dressed together with the neshama into the nefesh. And the, nef and the, the neshama and the ruach and the nefesh, they get dressed in garments. The main garments that it gets dressed in is thought, speech, and action. Each group of garments gets... Uh, uh, divided in many other groups, but the main groups are thought, speech, and action. And all this manifests into two types of nefashot. We know what's called the nefesh elokit, which is part of the neshama. The desire of the nefesh elokit is only to do God's will. And then I have a nefesh bemit, an animal soul. Now it's called nefesh behemit, not because it's an animal, behemah is an animal, rather because its character traits are as an animal. Like an animal wants to eat, an animal wants to hunt, an animal wants to sleep. All the character traits that you find in animals, we're going to find in our animal soul. And with this whole entire structure, now I have to deal with this world. And when Rabbi Chaim Vital says that I came to refine my midot, is that I have to define in my life what are the good midot, the good attributes, and with that serve Hashem, and to define and to recognize what are my bad midot, and to refine them, to clean them, to make them better, and to take these midot and to transform them. And my entire avodah in this world is that's what I have to do, is tikkun midot. And most of the issues that we deal with in this world comes from these midot, from these attributes. And we're going to dedicate a few shiurim to, to certain midot, that we can recognize them, how to, to operate, how to, to, to refine them. But first I have to understand the structure of everything. Now I told you that everything corresponds to the ten sefirot, the highest firak is called Ketel. Ketel is a crown. And everything is originated in the Ketel. Now in the Ketel there are certain tchunot, certain uh, uh, character traits. That's what's called molidot, certain emotions. Lolid is to give birth. The highest level in the Ketel is called Ratzon. Ratzon is a will, is a desire. Because we are motivated by a certain desire, a certain will. Anything that I want to do, something needs to motivate me to do it. So if I want to eat, what motivates me to eat is, my, is hunger. Or it just looks like a very good cake, so I want to eat it. So there's always going to be something that motivates me to do it. Same with sleep. Why would I, go to, why would I be motivated to sleep? Because I'm very tired. Or because tomorrow I have to wake up early in the morning, so I need to catch some sleep. Everything that I do will be motivated by some type of a desire, a will, that is called Ratzon. Now in my system there are two types of these desires, the Ratzon Elion, the desire of Hashem, and this is my desire. The desire of Hashem is to do anything that has to do with Torah and Mitzvahs. And my Nefesh Elokit will constantly operate from the desire of Hashem. It will constantly want to go to a Torah class to pray, to make sure that I'm eating kosher, that I'm saying the right thing, that my thoughts are pure. I have to reveal this ratzon, because most of the desires and the will that we want is not coming from the ratzon alion. It's coming from my ratzon, from my desire. Now the Baal Shem Tov explains that in the heavenly realm, there are two chambers, a chamber of purity, and a chamber of impurity. And any thought or speech or action or emotion, anything that is pure, I pull it down from the chamber of purity. And everything that is impure in my life, my thoughts, my speech, my action, anything, I'm pulling it down from a chamber of impurity. It's almost like the, the bank of energy where I take my energy from. 
like a, a, a person who is lying in bed in a hospital and he has an IV stuck to his hand. So one hand he has one IV and the other hand he has another IV and they're hanging over him. And whatever you're going to put in the bag, that's what's going to trickle into his body. So if you put vitamins and minerals and medicine and antibiotics, whatever, it will trickle into the body and will feed the person. If you put poison in one of these bags, then poison will trickle into the body. So I'm constantly connected to one of these chambers in Shemaim, in the heavenly realm, and that's where I pull my energy from. So if I'm having a bad thought that's coming into my mind, and I stop the thought right on the spot, and I make an analysis, where did the thought come from? If that thought is positive and pure, I know that it came from the, from the chamber of purity. Because that thought will be to help somebody, or to wake up in the morning and pray, or to be careful with what I say. It's easy to recognize. But if chas shalom, the thought or the speech is impure, sometimes you do something, something falls, or you get hit and you throw out a word that is not nice, then you know that this word just now came from a very impure place. So constantly I'm drawing down energy to my body through one of these chambers. The chamber of, of purity will empower my nefesh elokit. And the chamber of impurity will empower my nefesh abemit, my animal soul. And constantly, all day long, I have a battle in my body. I have two entities in my mind that are fighting with each other. I mentioned it in one of the classes that in our mind, we have a whole uh, meeting there. There's like conversations in our mind. One is saying this, one is saying that. There's constantly arguments in my mind. The point is to understand is how am I separating the, the jungle that's in my thoughts. I told you that the Rebbe from, from uh, Piasetsna said, he has a, a ma'amar that is called ma'amar hashkata. He's quiet, quieting your thoughts. And he says that if a person will sit down, it's actually a very good exercise to do on a daily basis. But you sit down, you close the door, you close your phone, you segregate yourself from the world, and you just think. You just sit and you let your minds think. And you don't do anything. You don't analyze the thoughts. You just look at your thoughts. And if you sit like this for five minutes, you realize that you have a jungle in your mind. Unbelievable thoughts are running in your mind, and crazy thoughts. And he says the only thing that separates us from a, a crazy person is that a crazy person actually is doing what he thinks. We just somehow control what we're thinking. But if you look at your thoughts, like looking at a screen, you'll realize that uh, like you, you, you would think you're crazy. What you would want to say to people, what you would want to do to people, what you would want to do right now. Sometimes you actually do it. You close the door, nobody looks. You behave totally different. Start dancing in a weird way. You do all sorts of weird things. Now for you it's normal because it's you. Sometimes it manifests into a way that you do it next to other people. The point is that in our mind there's a whole jungle. And I want to calm this jungle down so I can see what are the real thoughts and what are the nonsense. And why do I want to do all this? Well, what's the whole point? The whole point in this is that most of our lives are, are chaos. Almost any person in this world, their life is a chaos. Things don't work out. Constantly issues with relationships. Constantly issues with themselves. They don't know how to deal with things. Every person has a chaos in his life. Very few people know how to take control of their life, that their life is calm and they're satisfied and they're happy and everything is functioning how it should be. Amen. Now I mentioned the, last, the last class, I know you want to hear about it more, but we'll do it in, the, in one of the, the later classes. But we constantly operate in a motion that I'm building vessels and then I have to fill the vessels with light. And sometimes I will build a big vessel and there's not enough light in it then the reaction is going to be emptiness. And the emptiness will manifest into sadness and depression and all these emotions. Now sometimes I would build a very small vessel and I would start pulling too much light into this vessel. 
What's going to happen is, is it's going to be choser izun. It's going to be not, uh, not uh, balanced. I'm going to lose my balance. Because it's too much light. Too much light of something, and usually the light will be something positive. It's like a person who starts becoming religious, or a person that has some type of an awakening, and he's like, that's it. Now I'm going to go full force. And for a whole week, all day long, they're reading Tehilim and learning and praying and doing mitzvot, and too much light. They're bringing on them too much light. But their vessel cannot handle too much light, and within two weeks, they crash and they fall. And they don't want to do nothing. So we're always, constantly, we're working with, with this relation that I'm building a vessel, because when I want to, why am I building a vessel? Because I want to put light in it. Because if you're looking at the structure of our life, we constantly want to, to bring something to us that is positive, but we have to hold it and sustain it. In a very uh, uh, physical explanation, a person can have desire for cars, for beautiful cars, and he can have 10 cars, but he can only drive one at a time. And sometimes a person will have a lot of desire for good food, so you can go to a restaurant, there's a limit how much you can eat. You can order everything on the menu, but you can only eat a certain quantity, you cannot eat all the things on the menu. The other day we went with my kids to ice cream, so they had in the fridge like 30 t flavors. So my young kid was like, I want all, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. Yeah, but you can't put it even on the cone. So his answer was, okay, so give me a little bit from everything. He's smart. But the thing is that he, 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 he wanted to take everything, and even if we hypothetically would give him everything, he can't take it. So sometimes our ratzon, our desire, is, is beyond my kli, it's beyond what I can handle. So constantly there's a relation that I'm, I'm, I'm doing an action of, of what's called, in the terminology of Kabbalah, limshochorot, to pull things to me, but I have to have the right vessel to, to sustain it. And it can be in many different things. But Bezat Hashem, I know you have a lot of questions about Orot and Kilim. We'll do one of the shiurim, we'll get to that, that with more examples. But I'm explaining that is because constantly the relation has to fit to each other. Now, in many cases, I build a lot of Kilim, very big Kilim. And one of the ways to explain it is I build expectations. So from a relationship, I will build a lot of expectations, and the expectations will grow and grow and grow and grow, and then the behavior of that other person will not fit my expectations. This is a relation of very big vessel and a very small light. Now I have a very big and empty vessel because my expectations are high and I got disappointed because that person did not say what I wanted to hear. And then the result from that will be a crash. I'm going to be upset, I'm going to be depressed, I'm going to be unhappy. Why? Because I built these expectations around that individual. It can be in a relationship between a husband and wife, it can be mainly a relationship, you see it when you go and date. Soon you're going to start dating. You build expectations from something that has nothing to do with the reality. So a young lady will go on to a date, and we'll build expectations, he has to look like this, he has to talk like that, he has to do this, this is a list of expectations. And then the, the real person, the other half, is not half of the expectations. The result will be a very big vessel with very little light. And then the person is upset the entire life because the husband is not fulfilling the vessel. So we constantly have to realize what is my ratzon, what is my desire, and what is Hashem's desire. If I operate on my desire, my ratzon, recipe for destruction, a recipe for failure, and a recipe for, for, for never being happy. Because ultimately, ultimately, every human being wants the same thing. We all want to be happy. One person will be happy with a big home, one person will be happy with a lot of money, one person will be happy just by having health. Every person is going to be happy with something else. But ultimately, we're constantly running after one thing, which is called ta'anug, happiness. That's how Hashem built us. Hashem built us in a way that constantly I'm going to look and search for ta'anugot, for happiness. That's how Hashem can, can, can composed us. Why? Because Hashem is the essence of good. 
and teva tov le'ativ, the nature of good is to give, is to do good. And before the world was created, when somebody asks, why was the world created? Why does Hashem, if everything was so good, why did Hashem bother to build this world? What do we need this headache? Because the Zohar says, before the world was created, there was a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and all the souls were around this is the Kadosh Baruch Hu, enjoying this godly light that He was shining on the souls. He was shining His unbelievable love, His endless wisdom, and the souls were surrounding God like a ring and pleasuring this godly revelation. So everything was good. Why did we have to now ruin this party to come down to this world and to, to suffer? One might say. Because at some point the souls came to Kadosh Baruch and they said, Listen, we feel very embarrassed. We're ashamed. All you do is give us. And we're very upset and we're very uh, 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 sad. We're embarrassed. Because you just give us and give us and give us. And we want to give something back. The Zohar calls it Nehamad Sufa, bread of shame. Like a person that is embarrassed comes to your door every day, he knocks on your door, you give him a little bit of food like a poor person. It's embarrassing at some point. So the souls felt exactly the same. So Hashem says, no problem, I'll create a world. And I'll put your souls in bodies and I'll give you a lot of mitzvot to do. And you'll earn your reward. And by you earning your reward, you'll come back here and each one will get his reward according to his level. And by that, you don't have to feel shame anymore. You're going to earn what I'm giving you. And then before Hashem even blinked, the souls were like, no, 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 no. We were joking. You don't have to take us serious. But then it was already too late and the world was created and here we are. But the point is that the Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give us more. Like I said... Teva tov le'ativ, the nature of something good is to do better. Chazal say, Ratzah HaKadosh Baruch Hu lezakot et Yisrael, lefichach irba lehem Torah mitzvot. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give the Jews more, that's why he gave them a lot of Torah and mitzvot, so we can earn our reward and get more pleasure. The point is, the bottom line is, Hashem wants us to have happiness and pleasure. Now in this world, since it manifested so many levels, we lost the, the, where it originates from. So we're looking after these pleasures that has nothing to do with Hashem's will. So I would run after, constantly we're running after pleasures. And when I don't get my will, the result is going to be disappointment. And anger and sadness, etc., etc., etc. And this is the first midah we're going to talk about. Maybe we have time, we'll start talking about it today. But the main problem of most people is that they want to reach to that level of happiness and they will run after it. And some people will spend their entire life running after this happiness. And if it's not the will of Hashem, it will never come to, to, to action. It will never happen. And then the person is constantly running after nothing. This is again another form of building very big vessels and there's no light to put into this vessel. I gave an example, the first shiur, like people who meditate, there's ways to meditate. There's ways how the Torah teaches us how to meditate. It's, the, the, it's not the Indians who invented meditation. It's in Judaism meditation. But there's ways how to meditate. And when people take the form of meditation and distort it, and use it in a form of, of what's called avodah zarah. Avodah zarah is idol worship. But avodah zarah, the translation, is foreign work. Zara. It's foreign to me. Idol, people are imagining idol worship that I'm bowing to a statue. But idol worship in the translation from Hebrew, Avodah Zara, is it's something that is foreign to me. What is foreign to me? Anything that's not written in the Torah. Amen. Whatever is written in the Torah, that's how I have to serve Hashem. Anything that is not written in the Torah is foreign. So a lot of people too do, they want to reach their inner peace so they meditate. So instead of going to the source, which is the Torah, they go and look to all sorts of weird solutions. And you see in our days it's very popular that people meditate and they chant a certain sound. And this sound that they chant is one of Hashem's names. Aleph Av Mem. Hashem has 72 names. And each name has a certain power to it. And the name Aleph Vav Mem, they chant it like Ah, but they say the name Aleph Vav Mem. Now, what are they actually doing? 
that are actually pulling down this godly light into this world. It has a power. Every name of Hashem has a certain power. One is the power of healing, one of the, is the power of wisdom. Each name has a certain power. So this particular name, Aleph Vav Mem, that they're chanting, they're chanting, they sing it, repeating it. I don't want to say the name, but the sound is, ah, they're repeating it. So they're bringing down this godly light into this world, an unbelievable power, and they're building a vessel by actually meditating on this name, and they're building a vessel, and they're building it, and they're building it, and they're building because they're meditating on the name. So they're actually building the, the, the vessel. But then, they're not doing any Torah mitzvahs, so there's no light. So the vessel is completely empty. So they find themselves with this massive vessel, totally empty. So they're relaxed after the meditation for five minutes, and then the next day is total emptiness. Total, total emptiness. So people do commit suicide. This is totally, totally empty inside. Why not, why not the, like, in, in, you know, whatever, like, Buddhist people who meditate for years and years and years, and they seem to be very happy and try to do it for their old men or old men? First of all, what looks on the outside is not what's going on the inside. So none of them are like... I didn't say none of them because I don't know all, all of them. Some of them don't do it the right way, so nothing actually really happened. But the ones th that do it the right way, then, then they might appear on the outside very happy. And usually the case is that the more you empty inside, the more on the outside you pretend you're happy. Because you, you're in such a, a, a choser oizun, an unbalance, that if the inside is so empty, then the outside, the, the expression even, will, will look like happiness. You're going sometimes into a place and you look at people and and you see how people are like pretending that everything's good, and you see how fake it is. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about people who aren't especially like, showing that they're happy, they just seem to be like, scroll as in their teachers. I'm not negating. Could be that a lot of people are doing certain things. I'm giving one example out of many, because I met a lot of people that they, they were constantly focusing on the meditation, and on the surface, their life looked very peaceful and calm, but chaos in their mind. Maybe the body was calm, because they were also eating healthy, healthy and sleeping healthy and their body was maybe calm. But you don't know the chaos that's going on in their mind. I know the chaos that's going on in people's minds because when people come to me for therapy, I see the chaos that's in their mind. On the outside, they're like, go to a mental institution. Some of them are like sitting like that. <laughs> Why? Because the outside is very calm and relaxed, but the inside, whoo, jungle. World war in their mind and their emotions, a storm of emotions. So the, the more stormy it is inside, the more relaxed it looks on the outside. <sighs> That's the reality, that we just see the outside, we don't see what's going on inside. And sometimes, you know, you can walk into a room and a friend of yours on the outside looks all relaxed and happy and inside a whole storm of emotions. And because you know her, you can recognize that something's going on. And the reality is, in some places that you go, you go in the, in the world in different places, you see people, their faces like stretched, because they're like, you, you think they're happy, but it's the, the, the muscles are already, they can't handle what's going on. So their faces like, looks like they're happy. But inside is chaos. There's a story, it's a real story. You should look at it, maybe I'll, I'll, one time I'll bring the video. It's an amazing story of an Israeli who was a master in, in martial arts. What? Master in martial arts. Ah. Karate and all sorts of things like that. I don't know exactly what form, but his thing, he was a master in martial arts. Okay. And he, I don't know the entire story. I'm not gonna tell the story because it's very long. I'm just gonna tell the point. I don't wanna ruin the details because I don't remember the details. But from the little that I, that I heard about the story, he went to the Far East and he wanted to learn from the masters of the masters. And then he got to some place in some mountain and they told him, we can teach you the, the secrets of this form of uh, martial arts, but we can't just reveal it to you right away. You have to learn it and la la And he was working for years and training and meditating and all these things. And every time they would upgrade him to another level and to another level. 
And every time they would tell him a certain, I think they would tell him, uh, they would show him a certain shape, and they would tell him, meditate on that shape. For months, just meditate on that shape. There's much more to the story, because I don't remember all the details, but he would meditate on certain shapes, and every time he would meditate, meditate on one of these shapes, he was able to do things. He would like get, he would be raised above the ground. Mm -hmm. And then he would do all sorts of things. Long story short, at some point when he was worthy to find the ultimate secret of the powers, they took him into like a monastery on a mountain, into a cave, into all sorts of tunnels, and they made like the, the whole thing. And they, then they're taking him into this room, and he sees like this little cave in a, in a dark room, and there's like a, a, a curtain on a certain wall, and they're preparing him mentally and all this, and, the, and he's waiting to see the source of their powers. And then they open their curtain, and he sees Yud Kei Vav Kei. And he freaks out. He loses it. He literally loses it. And they're telling him, this is the source of our power. And everything that they taught him was derived from holy names of Hashem. All these shapes that they let him meditate was holy shapes, different forms. So he was able to bring all sorts of power. So when he was able to lift himself over the ground, he was able to invite these demons that would lift his body off the ground. Now he thought that he's doing it with his power, but actually he was bringing mamash, what's called kuchotuma, powers of impurity into the world and using them to do certain things. And the source to all of that was Yud Kei Vav Kei. Now, why did he freak out and lose, that, lose it? Because for months he was building all these vessels based on true things. But there wasn't any light in it. So the reaction that he lost his mind, completely got, freaked out. But then, Baruch Hashem, he, he came back to El Israel. He's now 100% observant. He found his real true source. The point is that in this world, when the Jews got the Torah, in Mount Sinai, people think that only we were invited to the party. And most people, they can't understand in their mind, they try to vision what was going on on Hal Sinai. First of all, people think that they were sitting like in front of the screen, but they were all like a ring around the mountain. You have to understand, we're talking about about three million people. People think they were sitting like in a movie house looking at a screen, but they were surrounded, they, they surrounded the mountain. What the, this side saw, the other side saw the exact same thing. There were so many miracles going on on the mountain that any direction you would stand, you saw the exact same show. But all the nations were also there. But they were on the outer ring. They also saw what's going on. That's one of the reasons why it's called the Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, because with the Torah that came down to the world, Yarda Sina'a la'olam. Hatred came down to the world. Because the nation saw how we are getting the Torah, and they're not getting the Torah. They saw everything, they read everything, they understood everything. The thing is that Hashem went first to all the nations and offered them the Torah. It wasn't that He just gave it to us. We were the only ones who said, Naseh Nishma. Because Hashem came to all the nations. You want the Torah? No. You want the Torah? No. He came to the Jews, you want the Torah? They didn't ask what it is, how it is. They just said, Naseh Nishma. When the Jews said Naseh Nishma was an earthquake in the world because the, the angels from Shemaim got very upset and they said, who, who revealed that secret? That's the secret of Naseh Nishma. Who revealed it? It was Moshe Rabbeinu who revealed it because Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shemaim. There was a whole argument if we should get the Torah because the Malachi Asharet, the angels, they, they, they disagreed. They told Hashem, we should get the Torah. Why, are you giving the Torah to these human beings? So Moshe Rabbeinu was invited to this meeting. And the story says that Moshe Rabbeinu was petrified. He's looking at these massive angels. And they're arguing that they should get the Torah. And Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Do to, no, explain to them why you should get the Torah. And Moshe Rabbeinu was very, very scared. So Hashem told him, hold my chair and just give them a... Your explanation. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, okay, let's see if the Torah is supposed to be for us. Let's see what the Torah says. So let's start with the Ten Commandments. So the first commandment is, you should not have another God, but, but your God. 
So he told the Malachim, the angels, you have Bechlad, the option of believing in something else, you see God. We don't see God, so it's easy for us to believe in other things. Anyway, it's a long story, and, and, and he starts going one by one, and then he reaches to Kabedet Avicha Veimecha, respect, honor your parents. So Moshe Rabbeinu tells the angels, you have parents. You don't even have parents to honor. We have parents. Then he goes to the next commandment, Lo Tirzach. He says, can you kill? You can't kill each other. Only we have the, the form of killing. So long story short, he goes one mitzvah after the other and proves to the Malachim that the Torah belongs to us. The story says that that's not really what was written in the Torah. When the Malachim were shocked and they were like, let me read it. And when they bent over into the Torah to see what was written, Moshe Rabbeinu scribbled all the letters. Because the original was not what, what we read. Moshe Rabbeinu mixed all the letters. And when he mixed the letters, that's what the Torah that we read. All the stories that we read. So the Malachim read it and like, wow, he's right. The original, how the Torah was written, is not what we read in the Torah. The stories actually happen. En mikra yotzei pshuto. That whatever is written in the Torah actually happened. If it says that Abraham Avinu did something, it actually happened. But the original story was completely different. That's why when we read the Torah every Monday and Thursday and Shabbat, if you notice, we lift up the Torah. And everybody's looking in the Torah. And this is when you lift up the Torah and you turn it around, because on the back of the Torah is written the original way, and we're looking at it, we don't really see it. Our neshama sees it. Our neshama sees, when you do Hagbaat Torah and you're looking in the Torah, if you're looking at the front, you see the letters. When the person turns it around, you see the back. For you, you see something empty. But the neshama sees the, exactly the original words of the Torah, which the Zohar says that the original words of the Torah, that's the Zohar. The Zohar, what's called the Pnimiuta Torah. If you look, if you learn the Zohar, you see that the Zohar is only talking about the five books. It's not talking about anything else. So the original is the Zohar. That's Moshe Rabbeinu scribbled it all up so the Malachim, the angel, would look and would not, under, would not understand. But anyways, we totally sidetracked. I don't even know how we got to that. We got to that to the point is that there are certain powers in this world that people know how to tap into it and they derive the power of that certain act or the mitzvah or whatever it is, but they're not doing it the right way. So the result will be a very big vessel that is going to be completely empty and the result from that will be complete sadness and emptiness. We got to that because I said that we constantly follow our desire to get pleasure. Constantly we're running after pleasure. Now, if this desire is not coming from the Ratzon Elion, from the will of Hashem, then I'm going to be running after ghosts. I'm going to be running after nothing. And the result will be disappointment and anger and, and, and all these emotions because I didn't get what I wanted. So my... My main focus should be on understanding and finding what's Hashem's will. And the day that I'm going to find what's Hashem's will, my life is going to be smooth because I'm not going to have any expectations that will not be fulfilled. So we talked about it in the last class before how I'm starting to reveal this Ratzon. But I think what we'll do is one of the last classes when we're, talk, when we're going to talk about more practical things, then we'll more... Talk about how am I actually focusing to find this Ratzon Elyon. But I want to start talking about certain Midot so we can start to understand and relate what do we mean by these Midot that we have to refine and work on. But now that I know more or less the structure of everything and what do I need to do, I need to find out how am I focusing myself, how am I targeting myself on the will of Hashem and what happens when I don't. Now, I explained in the first shiul that our, our soul has two, two components to it. It has what's called a midah, an attribute, and it has what's called ofi. Ofi is a character, and it's two separate things. So my character I can't change. There's no such a thing as changing a person's character. And this is the problem with most people in relationships, that they think that they can change the character of their other half, of their husband or their wife or their kid, but that's the character of the person and you cannot change it. You can refine it, you can kind of, you know, make it better, you can empower it, you can reduce it, but you cannot change the character. 
And this is the basic rule that people are trying to change other people's character and themselves. But you can't. That's where the midah comes in, the attribute. Now attribute in Hebrew is midah. Midah can also be explained as a measurement, as a quantity. It's not necessarily an attribute. So if I take a certain attribute, for example, the attribute of chesed, of kindness, it is also called love, I can use the attribute of chesed with a certain quantity. This is where the midah comes in. Midah is quantity. It can be a lot of kindness, it can be a little bit of kindness. So I can have a certain character. I can be a very generous character. Some people in their character, they're very generous, which is a very good character. But if it's used in a very exaggerated way, then it's extremely bad. So you see in our days, people, their character of kindness is out of control, so they will go and assist and help a terrorist that is wounded on the floor. This is the, the extreme way to explain this, the character is kindness. But the midah, the attribute of chesed is out of control, that I'm helping somebody who just tried to come and kill me. So this is one extreme way of showing how an, a, a good character and a good mida can be used in a very extreme way and the result is going to be completely not normal. So this is taking the, the, the attribute of kindness, of chesed, and not controlling it. Now how would I control it? I would take the mida of gvura, of severity, and I will restrain this kindness. And then my kindness will be balanced. So the midah itself is, don't, don't just look at it as an attribute, rather look at it also as a measurement, as a quantity. How much kindness, how much severity, how much love. Because sometimes you have to use a very small portion of the midah. Sometimes you have to put a lot, a very high portion of the midah. Portion is also another way of translating midah. It's the quantity of it, the portion of it. So, we constantly have these midot, these emotions that we're dealing with. I started telling you before that the highest character trait of our neshama that comes from the sphere of Keter is what's called the ratzon, the, the, the desire. The ratzon will give birth to something that is called ta'anug, pleasure. We went through that. And the ta'anug, the pleasure, will give birth to emotions, to regesh, regeshot. So I have to center it that my ratzon is focused on the ratzon of the Kadosh Baruch Hu. That will bring me the desire for the pleasure that I will pleasure on things that have to do with Kedusha. And you see it with a person who observes Shabbat, he gets pleasure out of the Shabbat. Take a person who doesn't observe Shabbat, put him in a religious home for this Shabbat, he will not get any pleasure out of it. He will want to jump out of his skin. He can't handle it. He can't handle the Shabbat. Because he's not aligned with the will of a Kadosh Baruch A person, a religious person, will go to a service in the synagogue and will have pleasure from hearing the Chazan, will have pleasure from the Dvar Torah, the Rasha of the Rabbi, will have pleasure from just sitting in a holy place and pull a person from the street and tell him, sit here for two hours, he will go crazy. So the pleasure can come from the Ratzon Elion, and the pleasure can come from what gives me pleasure. You'll take a religious person that is very elevated and refined and put him in a, in a soccer game. He doesn't know what to do here. He's, he, he, he will get up and leave after two minutes. He's not going to understand why they're kicking the ball and why, why is it so exciting that the ball is flying from side to side. He would look at it like, what, what, this, what is this? Really? Yeah, it's really. Like no. No, he's really a person, I'm talking about a person who's really refined. Take now a big rabbi and put him in, in, a, in, a, in a basketball game. He's not going to even look in the game. He's going to read his book. He's not going to understand what's going on even in this game. I'll give you one example that is off the subject, but there's a very big rabbi in our generation in Israel. He's called Reb Chaim Kanievsky, one of the greatest scholars in our generation. And they came to him with a question, and they told him that there's a certain individual who became religious. And he really loves to play basketball. And he wants to know if he can play basketball on Shabbat. 
So they went to the Rav and they told him, this individual wants to know if he can play basketball on Shabbat. So he's in such a high level that he told them, what's basketball? So they told him that you take a ball and you put it in a basket. <laughs> so, so, he, so he answered them, why can't he put the ball in the basket out of Shabbat? Why does he have to put it in Shabbat? <laughs> so, you know, this is the level of a man that you put him in a basketball game, he's going to look and say, this is a nuts house, and they let the crazy people go free on the, on the court. That's how he would look at it. Why? Because he's focused on the Ratzon of the Kadosh Bechu. And trust me, the Kadosh Bechu does not want 12 men or 15 men or whatever amount of men are on the court to kick balls. That's not the Ratzon of the Kadosh Bechu. So when somebody is focused on the will of the Kadosh Bechu, he doesn't relate to the mundane things. Put him in front of a movie, he will think it's, it's a crazy thing. I don't need to give too many examples. You got the point. Feel and I can see that it's like something that is not important. Like, let's say you're watching a certain movie or a certain series. I know that it's not important. I know it doesn't give me real pleasure. I know it's not good for me. But then, like for some reason, there's such a struggle towards it. And I know that my neshama wants something different. I know that the real pleasure lies somewhere else. But for some reason, I can't even like reason with myself. It's like, I feel like where does that come from? That like. This comes, this comes directly from your nefesh abe, the, uh, the fight between your nefesh abeymit and your nefesh elokit. But why does it feel so real? Like, like what you just said about putting a, ba a ball in a basket, it's ridiculous. It's like completely ridiculous, but why are we so connected to things that are like ridiculous? They're not even, it's not even real pleasure. Like, exactly. So where does it come from? This, like, where does the strong like, pull come from? The strong pull comes from the, the desire of the nefesh abeymit. The Nefesh Abemit only wants to do physical things. It doesn't want you to do anything spiritual. So its entire desire, the Ta'ava, that the Nefesh Abemit has is all these things. And the pull is going to be extremely, extremely strong. Why does it always win? Like, why it doesn't always win. Okay, That's the thing. Always, but like, why, does it often, like, why, does it, why does it feel like so like, impossible? We, we're going to have one shiur just talking about the Nefesh Abemit and the Nefesh Elokit. But this is exactly your Avodah. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the Zohar that our main avodah in this world is called Kad Itkafia Sitracha. To subdue the other side of holiness. Itkafia is to subdue. And he gives an example of two people in a ring fighting with each other. One overpowers the other one, so the other one that is winning is in power, the other one is on the floor. And then the one is on the floor, rises up, and he punches him, and they constantly fighting. There can only be one winner. It can be two winners. So one is the Nefesh Abemit, one is the Nefesh Elokit, and they're constantly fighting with each other. And my job in this world is to itkafia sitracha, is to take the sitracha, sitracha is the other side of holiness, and to subdue it. My sitracha, my, my, my Nefesh Abemit wants to see this movie, and the pool is going to be so strong that it would look so real and good. This is what's called in the Zohar, Alma de Shikra, the world of lie. So the Nefesh Abemit will make a lie and will pull you towards it. Now comes the Nefesh Elokid, has to start fighting it. This is it, Kafia. And all day long, you're in the motion of it, Kafia. All day long. Oh, that, that we're going to talk about it. Now, the results of this form of it, Kafia, is what's called it, Habcha. It, Habcha is to transform. The Zohar says, it, Habcha, Chashocha, Lenhora. Transforming the darkness into light. So if a person practices what's called itkafia, and all day long we have to do itkafia, it's to subdue our desire, then the result will be is that I transform the darkness into light. This is what I was created for. That's what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in Zohar. I was created to subdue the Yetzirah, and all day long, this, this Sitra Acha is going to come to me and flash all these billboards that will take my attention all day long. Why? To remove me from focusing on Kedusha. This is the general idea. One of the shiurim we're going to do at the end of the series is about the fight between the Nefesh Elokit and the Nefesh Abemit, where it's coming from, how to re re diminish the Nefesh Abemit, etc., etc., because this is all has to do with, with Avodat Midot, because the Midot are in the Nefesh. 
the intellect is a high level. The intellect, what's called mochin, chokhmah, bina, vedat, that's in the nefesh elokit. But the midot, the attributes, is in the nefesh abemit. And I have to now take the nefesh abemit and refine its midot. So the main avodah is constantly understanding the operations of the, the nefesh abemit and to control it. And I'll give you one example. I think we have enough time to talk about one of the midot and you'll, you'll start understanding. But it, we're going to do one shiur just about the nefesh abemit and the nefesh elokit and the motion, this whole action of itkafia. And why is it coming? And where is it coming? And how I can neutralize it? And how can I empower, empower the nefesh elokit? The more that I feed the nefesh abemit, the more it will get stronger. The more I feed the nefesh elokit, the more it will get stronger. So if I have a very strong nefesh abemit that constantly wants me to do all sorts of nonsense, then I have to feed the nefesh elokit. I can't fight the direct the nefesh abemit. I have to constantly feed the nefesh elokit with Torah and mitzvahs and learning and observing the mitzvot and all these. I'm empowering my nefesh elokit. So I'm making the nefesh elokit stronger to fight the nefesh abemit. But my entire uh, 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 focus is I have to refine the midot, the attributes of the nefesh abemit, because the, the attributes of the nefesh abemit are negative, and the attributes of the nefesh elokit are positive. And one of the most dominant and most important midah is called midat ha'anava, humble. Now the positive aspect of, midah, of this midah is called anava, to be humble. The negative, the leumatze, is the effect of anava, is what's called gasut aruach. Yeshut. In our terminology, it's called ego. The opposite of being humble. Now, this is the most powerful and most important mida, And this is the mida that everybody has an issue with. And when a person reaches to the level that his midata anava is empowered, then he will reach to a much higher spiritual level. That's why we see that Moshe Rabbeinu was the most humble person ever, and therefore he reached to the highest level of, of prophecy, to a level that no other prophet would ever reach even to his level. Mashiach is not going to be a greater prophet than Moshe Rabbeinu. When Mashiach comes, Moshe Rabbeinu comes with him. And Moshe Rabbeinu is always going to be a greater prophet than everybody. Mashiach is going to be the king, he's going to have also Ruach HaKodesh, and Nevoah, and all these things, prophecy, but Moshe Rabbeinu is going to be a greater prophet than, than Mashiach. And no other prophet in history ever reached to the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu would talk to Hashem face to face. When he was alive, I mean when he was awake, all the other prophets, they got their prophecy when they slept, in their sleeping, in their dreams. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu reach to that level? Because he reached to the highest level of Anava. He was the most humble person. So this is the most important Midah. Now you have to understand that every Midah it's like, it's, it's like a trunk, and then it has branches to it. And if I control the top, uh, uh, let's call it a trunk, then the branches will be under control. So looking at the positive side of the, of the midah, is a person is humble. Now midata anava has two types, two, two, two categories in it between a, what's called ben adam lamakom, between me and Hashem, and ben adam lechavero, between me and another person. The opposite of midat anava, we're going to talk about it in a second, it's called gasut aruach, being chutzpedek, being chutzpah, chutzpan. This is called gas, very coarse. I call it ego, because our ego is the opposite of humbleness. If, I, if, I, if I'm humble, I don't have an ego. And you know, from all the classes, I constantly repeat, our main obstacle is our ego. So in the Midata Anava, first of all, it's between me and another person. Ben Adam Lechavero. What does it mean to have Midata Anava between Adam Lechavero, between one person to the other? Is that I see only good in another person. I don't see something bad in anybody else. More than that, I constantly judge a person favorably. Every person I judge, the Kaf Every single, 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 single. You can be. You can. And we're going to get into it because I know already what's going on in your mind. How can you judge a terrorist to Kafschut? 
And how can you judge a rapist? Chas v'shalom lo aleinu to akaf zchut. I know the things that's going on in your mind. We're going to get to all of that. That's the example that I'm giving. I'm sorry I'm giving extreme examples, but... So, exactly. That's why I'm telling you, don't worry, we're going to get to that. That's why I gave the example before that a person can have the attribute of chesed in an exaggerated and uncontrolled way, and he saves a terrorist. So also, there's... A, there's where do you judge a per who do you judge to, to have schut? We're going to get to that, don't worry, we're going to cover everything. I don't know if we're going to get to do it today, I think we have to finish in five minutes. But the midah of anava between Adam and Chavero is based on three things. A, that I see the good in everybody. B, that I always constantly judge them to have schut, constantly. And the most important thing is that I don't see anyone that I'm better than him. That I constantly see everybody that they're just as good as me, and probably even better. This is midat anava between ben adam lechavero. Ben adam lamakom between me and Hashem is that I basically accept everything that happens that comes from Hashem. This is midat anava. Now, if I don't accept that something can happen from the from Hashem, this is the opposite of midat anava. That I'm disagreeing. With, with, the, with the Hanhaga, with how Hashem controls the world. Well, that would be the opposite of Midat Anava between me and the Kadosh Bokho. So I would see something happening. I, di I, 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 didn't, I didn't close a business deal. This date didn't work out. That didn't work out. Something in my life didn't work out. If I'm not accepting that it came from Hashem, then I'm doing the opposite of Midat Anava between me and the Kadosh Bokho because I'm not agreeing with what Hashem decided to do. Which, when you look at it, this is chutzpah. This is the opposite of humbleness. This is gesut aruach. I think that I'm something that I have even a, 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 an opinion here. And this is the problem with most people, that they don't agree with what Hashem is doing. So you have here two channels, what you have to concentrate on in Midat Anava. Now, the negative part of Midat Anava is the opposite of Midat Anava. We talked about Gesut Aruch. Gesut Aruch is being coarse and being very, very, eh, 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 I don't know how you even translate, chutzpah. But you're being very, very coarse. And more than that, is that you have an ego. You, you, in Hebrew, it's called Yeshut. I'm something. I'm something. Yeshut is also what's called a Metziut. I'm an existence. I don't humble myself. The more I humble myself, the more I diminish myself, the more I'm nothing. The more I'm nothing, the more I'm actually bigger because I'm able now to receive more. The more a person has ego, the more a person finds himself as something, as a metziut, as an existence, he's blocking all the shefa. He can't get anything. The more I humble myself, the more shefa I can get. If I come into a class now, and in my mind I think I'm, I'm more knowledgeable than the teacher, I will never get anything from him. Because I think that I know better than him. Now if I come to the class totally humble, assuming that the teacher is teaching the right thing, I will accept, I will get this shefa. It will absorb it into my mind. If I come with a little bit of ego, it will not sink into my mind. Because I'm better than him. And I'm smarter than him. Now the Mida always will manifest, what I said, will give birth to another Mida. The negative Mida that will give birth from the opposite of Midat Anava is anger and sadness. Midat Atzar, Midat Akas. These all three Midot are considered to be the worst. <coughs> Geava, the Geava is the opposite of Anava. Geava is it's not, I can't really say pride, but Geava is the opposite of Anava, is, is, is a, as a person that is constantly thinks that, you know, I did it, this is my self-pride. person makes a lot of money, he says, oh, I made it. I closed the deal. You see sometimes uh, 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 generals in the army, oh, I conquered this place. You didn't conquer anything. Hashem moved you. So they have this pride. I did it. This is the opposite of humbleness. This is Geava, being pride. So the Tolada, the birth out of Geava, out of pride, this opposite of humbleness, will be anger and will be sadness. 
And these are the three midot that are the hardest midot to work on. They are the worst ones. E every one of these midot, I'm basically, you know, our sages say that any person that that's empowers one of these attributes is considered like as if he's doing idol worship. Chazal say that a person that is angry, as if, as if he did idol worship. Why? Because he does not accept that what happened to him happened from Hashem, meaning that he doesn't believe right now in Hashem. He believes that something else had control over the situation. This is a form of idol worship. Again, idol worship is not bowing to a statue. Idol worship comes from the word in Hebrew, avodah, zara. Zara is foreign. So when I get angry, why do I get angry? Hashem did it. Why do you get sad? Hashem did it. So these are the, the tolada, what gives birth from the opposite of humbleness. So this is the three midot that we constantly have issues with. And if I'm deriving it from what I said before, these chambers of, of purity, then my thoughts, my speech and will action will be humble. That's why our sages teach us, don't be quick to answer. <laughs> think before you say something. Because if you really think before you're going to say something, your action will be, as, will be appropriate, will be the right way. And if I right away say something, means that I didn't process the thoughts, so I reacted with a certain word, which will bring me to a certain action that will be negative. So we ran out of time. Oh, no, we actually have a few more minutes, right? Yeah. Minutes. I think they said 12.25. I know the, 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 she always waits outside, so I don't want to take her time. It's not nice. So the thing is, okay, going back. So the point is like this. When I want to work on my midah, I have to first recognize the, where it's coming from. And constantly a person needs to, 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 to sift the thoughts. So a thought will come into my mind. A certain thought will come into my mind. Now I have to stop the thought right, right away. Where did it come from? So my thought will come as a form of, of the opposite of being humble. A person will say something to me, and right away I will become defensive. My thought will arouse a, a, a comeback. So I have to stop it right away. If I don't stop it and the thought is out of control, then the thought will give birth to speech and that will give birth to an action. Mm -hmm. Thought, speech and action. If I stop the thought right away, because the thought comes from the, from the ratzon. I told you, first comes the ratzon, then comes machshava. Now, if I stop it right at the level of the thought, then I can start, okay, dissecting. Where did this thought is coming from? Now, assuming that we'll give just one example. A person said something to me. Now, I can have two channels, two paths, how to deal with it. The first path is to get all defensive, assuming the person said something that I don't like. Then I'm going to get defensive. Why? Because my pride was hurt right now. What will that bring, give birth to? To anger. How dare he said that? And then the anger will start burning in me. The result after the anger will be sadness. After I calm down, the anger comes down, then I'm going to be sad. I can't believe that he said that. He thought that. He thinks I'm such a bad person. It will bring me, after the anger comes down, then the sadness will come. I told you that everything in this world is built from four elements. Our entire midot, our attributes, are controlled by these elements. The elements are fire, air, water, and earth. Everything in the world is built from these elements, physical and spiritual, good and bad. As other we're going to have one shiur just about the elements. Because the elements control my midot. And if I know how to recognize in every emotion the element, I'm right away able to neutralize it and to control it. So for example, the, 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 the emotion of anger comes from the element of fire. Because the fire consumes everything that you put in it. Everything you throw in the fire, the fire will consume it. This is anger. The nature of fire is to go up. Anger just goes worse and worse. It goes up. The same motion of like fire. 
When a person is angry, anything in his path, he runs it over. Screaming, yelling, pushing, like fire, destroys. Anger gets, you know, in, like, like in, in, inflated. A person usually gets more angry, and more angry, and more angry. It goes out of control, like fire, it goes out of control. Now sadness, that already comes from the element of afar, of, of sand, of earth. Why? Because afar is very heavy, earth is very, very heavy. Sadness is the motion of being very heavy. Sad and depressed and this heaviness. And the thing is that the, the, one of the character traits of afar, that it swallows everything you put in it. Anything you put on the ground, it will swallow it or absorb it. You put grains in the ground, it swallows it. And what does it do after that? It breaks it into pieces. You put a kernel, like a little seed, into the ground. The power of the afar is to destroy it into pieces. It, it, make, it rots it. Anything you put in the ground will make it rot. You put a body in the ground, it will rot the body. That's why we go back into the ground. That's why we bury it in the ground. Because the afar has the power of breaking and dissecting something and completely making it rotten. That's why the character, the ofi, of, of sadness, the nida of sadness, eventually when it pulls somebody more and more and more and more to into a depression, the person becomes more rotten and more rotten, and at some point it totally destroys him, completely destroys that person. So these two character traits is the two opposites, afar and esh, fire and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and earth. Now, if you're looking at it, anything that you put in the fire, the fire will consume and will make it a foul. You put a piece of wood into the fire, it will burn it, make it ash. Anything you put ash is like a foul, but it's not exactly the same thing, but the same idea. Anything you put in the fire, it will burn it and will make it a foul. So we see first will come the gava, the opposite of humbleness. That will cause the tolada, that will give birth into straight away to anger. And from anger will come the sadness. So if a person is going through one of these midot, if a person is angry, this is already a tolada. It's after I already, uh, I already broke the barrier of, of humbleness. I'm already upset right now. Now I'm upset. I couldn't stop it in the level of my machshava. Now it's already in my emotions. So if I'm already in the motion of anger, again I have to put, okay, put the screen down. Now, okay, why am I angry? Start dissecting the, the, the feelings. Why did this person now got me angry? Because if I'm not going to control my anger, it will go into sadness. And if I start dissecting where did it come from, where did the anger come from? Okay, because he said that word. Why did he say that word? Because he's mean. No, because I said something that got him to say something at me. So maybe at the end of the day I was wrong, not him. Or sometimes it's not like that. I'm just giving you one out of many examples. Sometimes I will get upset because something that happened, and it's not necessarily Ben Adam Lechaverot, it will be Ben Adam Lamakom between me and Hashem, because Hashem did something, situation happened, and it's not to my liking. It's not how I wanted it to be. It's not how I planned the situation to be, so I will get upset, like a little kid. You want to dissect your midot, you look at kids. Because kids, their midot are out of control. They don't know how to control their emotions. So you take from the kid a little lollipop, he goes crazy. He can't control the loss of this little thing that is sticky. He doesn't, have, he doesn't understand, you know, you, you, you can, something serious will happen. You'll tell him, your parent has to go hospital. I don't care, give me the lollipop. And you see that... I'm talking about a two-year-old, a three-year-old. He doesn't understand serious things. You tell the three-year-old that there's a war, he doesn't even know what's a war. You'll tell him somebody stole your, your toy. <gasps> he touched my toy! This is already corresponding to what's called that, that they don't understand. But what I'm saying is, the example that I'm saying is that you want to kind of relate to the midot, you look at the behavior of kids. Because the kids don't evaluate the situation the right way, so they get angry of nonsense. And they get ex excited and upset from, from nonsense. That's how our midot are out of control. As Ad Hashem, in the next year we're going to dissect more the midot of, of Anava, and uh, the opposite of what's called Geava, and 
anger and uh, sadness. We'll give more, I'll, we'll give more examples and, and dissect it into a more way how can I actually handle it and then how I actually apply what I said, the to judge everybody favorably, even though they did an extreme horrible thing. We'll continue from that and then we'll talk about other midot and eventually we'll get to everything. I'm going to ask me outside because the other Mora is here, okay?